Good morning, Parkview. We are so glad you're here with us this morning. And by the way, this is our last Sunday for us to not be together. And so we are excited. Next Sunday, June 7th, we're asking that you come together. And uh, we've got some, uh, if you haven't checked out online, we've got an announcement. We've got a video. We've got a Breeze check-in system. And, and you probably got, that's just what we call it, Breeze but um, Breeze is our check-in system, so we are asking that if you are intending to come next Sunday, that you actually register for the service. It's really important that you do that because we are preparing now, this week, and this next week, we are already preparing for you. Um, so we're excited to have everybody back, um, and there's obviously going to be some big changes as far as where you enter and and those kind of things. If you got the letter, you know a little bit about that. Um, but we are so excited, and, and we cannot wait. Um, I'm looking forward to it because uh, we, we we love doing this together and making it happen. But it's a whole lot easier to talk to um, everybody rather than the camera. So, but we're um, we're here today, and we're here and ready to worship. And so we're going to do that. Let me let me start out with a word of prayer, Father. We thank you so much for today. We thank you that, God, you've brought us this far, and, and even in this process, the things that we've learned, the things that we maybe took for granted, Lord, um, Lord, help us to realize we know how important it is to be together as a church body and, and that we were made um, to connect with one another. And, Father, we're just asking that you keep us safe. We ask that you be with our people right now and, and even those who are struggling um, with with this uh, illness lord we ask that you protect those families even some of our own lord and father you continue to watch over them and lord we love you and we thank you for the blessings of life in christ's name we pray amen let's get ready to worship in stories of what they think you're like but I've heard tender whispers of love in the dead of night as you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers, far and one. Searching for answers, only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am. It's who you are. 
in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us.
His love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed to hear my mocking Among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, nor wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Good morning, Parkview. Um, every week we come to this time, and this time where we take the bread and the cup, and we know that as you are home, maybe there's a way that you've chosen to do this, um, and take this bread and cup, and we do this to do it in remembrance of our Lord and Savior who, is, who gave up his life for us as a ransom for us. And um, as I was reading in 1 Corinthians, it, it, it talks about Jesus, and Jesus is quoted here from Jesus' words himself. He says, The Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said this, This is my body in which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup, and wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed by uh, with my b blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you announce the Lord's death until he comes again. And as I, list, as I, I read those words, those words were heavy. It says that every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you announce the Lord's death until he comes again. And I thought about that, and I thought about the, the Lord's death. The thing that we're announcing is that his sacrifice and that, that he gave for us. And, and I was reading in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's 
book, The Cost of Discipleship, the very first chapter talks about costly grace. It says this, and I'll read just a few words or a few uh, paragraphs here. It says, cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting today for costly grace. Cheap grace means grace sold on the market like cheap jacks, wares. The sacraments of forgiveness of sin and the consolation of religion that are thrown away at cut prices. Grace is represented at the church's inexhaustible treasury from which she showers blessings with generous hands without asking questions or fixing limits. Grace without price, grace without cost. And these words that he wrote years ago was this, cheap grace therefore amounts to the denial of the living word of God. In fact, the denial of incarnation of the word of God. But this, this is heavy. He says, cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. And so when we come to this table, and I want to read these words from Paul as I continue in 1 Corinthians 11. It says, so anyone who eats of the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord unworthily or is guilty of sinning against the body of blood of the Lord. That is why we should examine ourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat of the bread and drink of the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. And so he's saying that, you know, this moment is not about cheap grace. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, imagine if, if, if someone who was preparing a meal, like your mom was preparing this meal and, and, and she'd spent all this time and, and you just run and you just go outside the house without even, you know, just grabbing a couple bites and just running on. But in this moment, when we take this time, it is a time of reflection. It is a time for us to reflect on what Christ has done and that we do not take it lightly because it's not about cheap grace. It's about the sacrifice that was made on the cross for you and I. The body that was broken and the blood that was poured out. And I think that sometimes in the moment that we maybe don't want to take it because maybe we feel unworthy the only thing that I would say about that is, it is the cross, it is the sacrifice that makes it worthy. That you and I, and I love how this, my note says at the bottom, it says that awareness of your sin should not keep you away from the communion, but drive you to participate in it. As Christians, as believers in Christ, we take this time to remember that sacrifice that was made for us. And it shouldn't make us put our hands up and, and shy away from it. But because of the cross, because of the sacrifice, it should draw us in. Every single one of us are sinners, and we're unworthy. But we are made worthy through the blood of the Lamb. And so as we take this time, may it not be a moment that we just rush through but remember how important it truly is to participate in this meal. Let's pray. Father, at this time, we, as we take this cup, as we take the bread and, and the juice, may we remember the sacrifice. May we remember that all that was to take place to prepare for this moment, and we may we not take it lightly, but we, may we reflect on where we are and where you're moving us to. And Father, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for his body. It was broken for us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
Good morning, Parkview. Uh, welcome to what I believe is our last uh, virtual sermon uh, before things reopen on June 7th. There are videos explaining what's going to happen and uh, there'll be announcements. There's sign-ups because we need to make sure that we don't crowd the pews too much and that we allow for social distancing. So please look at the Parkview Facebook page so that you can sign up. You know, what, what a strange time we are living in. I, you know, I remember probably about four weeks ago, Wendy and I were at home watching, you know, Brian preach from our couch. And when it came time to have communion, Wendy got up, she got like a little saucer plate. Uh, it had two oyster crackers and two shot glasses. Now we don't drink, so they were measuring cups. Uh, and they were filled with grape juice. And I don't know why on that particular Sunday, but it struck me that those of us living today who are believers had to make kind of similar decisions that the Jews made when they went into exile uh, without the torture and all of that. But it just, when she brought that to me, it was just like, wow, we're like the Jews of the dispersion, the Jews of the diaspora. And so how did this act of communion bring me back to the Jews in exile when the Babylonians had conquered uh, the southern kingdom Judah, led the Jews out of Jerusalem and out of Judah on hooks. They kind of paraded them out like victory. So how did my mind go all the way back to that time? Well, as Wendy was bringing communion, I was looking at those oyster crackers and I was thinking, wow, we have had to figure out how are we going to worship God when we're living in a time where, you know, Governor DeWine has asked us not to meet as a congregation. He's asked us to please stay at home if possible. You know, so we're basically, we're operating under these stay at home orders. We cannot get to Parkview and worship as a body. And so what we had to do was figure out how do we worship God in these troubling times? And that's exactly what the Jews had to do during the exile. The Babylonians came in, destroyed the temple, conquered Judah, and like I said, led the Jews out. And so now that they're in exile, now that they are living and scattered among the Gentiles, they had to figure out how do we worship God when we're no longer in the promised land, when we no longer have access to the temple. So how do we worship God in these troubling times? You know, we are, like I said, we are doing something similar because the coronavirus removed our normal ways of worshiping. You know, historians say uh, that while the Jews were in exile, they, de they developed the synagogue form of worship. So the word synagogue means a gathering place. And when the Jews found themselves living outside the promised land, they decided they would get families to gather together. And I believe if they had 10 families, they could start a synagogue. And um, they would pray and worship God corporately or communally. So it was after this revelation, I texted Brian and I said, I would love to preach on this subject. And Brian thought it was a pretty good idea except um, we have Mother's Day coming up. 
So that's why we, uh, I'm grateful that he allowed me to preach on this topic today. And it kind of fits in with this overall theme of fear that we've been uh, looking at. Because when our lives get disrupted, it's normal to become fearful. And like, okay, what do we do now? And, you know, I got excited about the opportunity to develop this message. And my initial focus was, I'm going to compare the times today to the diaspora, you know, when the Jews were scattered. But then I started thinking about it. And the more I thought about it, I discovered that God's people throughout history have always had to figure out a way to worship God in troubling times. I don't think any generation's been free from this burden. And today's sermon is going to be a little bit different. It's just going to be kind of like a recitation of history with a little application at the end. Um, so I'm only going to look at a handful of situations, and you're probably going to think of more, and you might, you're probably going to think of better examples. And if you would, go ahead and you know, write it in the comments. You know, if you're on Facebook, go ahead and write a comment there as things come to your mind, or the same thing on your, if you're on YouTube. And all YouTubers will tell you, uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you'll be alerted whenever Parkview uh, has a new video. So go ahead and do that now. All right, very good. So uh, as I was looking at these examples, what I, what I kind of figured was, that, figured, you know, is that we can worship God wherever we are because the church is the people of God. You know, if we get technical, we don't go to church. We go to a building at 1912 Burbank Road, uh, and we assemble as part of what is called God's universal church. So even though we have not been assembling here at 1912 Burbank Road, Parkview Church has continued to assemble and worship God in troubling times. We just did it from our homes, around the computer, or television if it's a smart TV, or our smartphones. We were able to come together as a body of believers and worship. Now, Adam and Eve had to learn how to worship God after they were banished from the Garden of Eden. So boom, right out of the gate, Adam and Eve have to figure out how they're going to worship God in troubling times. And we're only in Genesis 3, okay? So this is how far back this stuff goes. Adam and Eve had a special bond with God. In Genesis 3.8, it talks about how, how, the, how then the man and his wife heard the sound um, of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of day. So they were in the presence of God in the garden in the cool of the day. They were there together and I believe they were worshiping God. So they worshiped God within God's presence. But all of that changed when sin entered the world. While they did not commune with God in the garden any longer after their sin, they didn't abandon God, and God did not abandon them. Uh, in chapter 4, we read how Eve uh, gave birth to Cain, and she said, With the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. So there was, this, there was still this connection to God, even though it was not the normal one. And from this verse, I gathered Adam and Eve worshipped God in part through praise because she recognized this birth did not happen apart from God. Later in the chapter, we see Cain and Abel uh, present offerings to God. So this was another way they worshipped God beyond the garden. Now, 
I asked my former Old Testament professor, Dan Dyke, if he could point me to other ways in which Adam and Eve worshipped God after they were exiled from the garden. And he said, look at chapters 4 through 6, and you will see that they started to call on the name of the Lord. Indeed, they did. When chapter 4 comes to a close, it says, at that time, the people began to call on the name of the Lord. It seems that instead of being with God, Adam and Eve had to seek God out. They had to call on his name. The next person I want to look at is Noah. Noah needed to figure out how he was going to worship God, he and his family, after the flood. Noah was a righteous man in wicked times. In Genesis 6, 5 through 8, you know, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of uh, man had become, and every uh, inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only on evil all the time. So God regretted that he even made humanity because we had fallen so much. And he was deeply troubled. In verse 7 it says, So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I made them. Then we get to verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God saved Noah, his wife, his sons, and uh, their spouses through the ark. A great flood destroyed the world as we know it, but Noah and his family were spared. So everything changed for them, literally. But as soon as they are able to leave the ark, Noah has to figure out, how do we worship God? And in Genesis 8.20 it said, that Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. So that's how Noah figured out how to worship God after the flood. Now we get to Abraham. Abraham learned that God was the God of everywhere. In Genesis 12, God, God calls Abram, and after he makes a covenant with God, he becomes Abraham. I'm just going to call him Abraham all the time. He says, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. That's in 12.1, and then verse 2 says, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So Abraham had to leave his family and his home for a place he did not know. In Genesis 12, 6, it says that Abraham travels as far as the great tree of Morah at Shechem, and while there, he builds an altar to the Lord. Later, he travels to the hills east of Bethel, and he pinches a, pitches a tent and builds an altar to God there, and he calls on the name of God. So why are these accounts significant? The fact that, okay, he's traveling, he builds an altar, travels, builds an altar. I think these accounts um, of building altars show the power of the one true God. Because during this time, Gods were thought to be just local deities. There was a god of the hills, a god of the stream, a god of the rivers, god of the forest, god of the trees. Just gods everywhere. They were local deities. And wherever you lived, you worshipped that local deity. In Joshua 24, um, in verses 2 and 3, Joshua says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, 
the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. It's very likely Abraham worshipped other gods as his father did. And like I said, at the time, these gods were territorial. So every time Noah is going out and he's building an altar, he is building that altar in the territory of another god, quote unquote. So my professor Dan Dyke said that every time Noah built that altar, he might have been afraid that he was going to offend the local deity and that he would get in trouble. But when Abraham built these altars and nothing happened, God was showing Abraham that he was the God of everywhere. No matter where he set his foot, God was his God. So when Abraham's world changed, he learned that he could worship God anywhere because God was the God of everywhere. So whether it was Moses leading the people out of Egypt, Joshua leading the people into the promised land, God's people being divided into two kingdoms, or God exiling his people out of the promised land, God's people has, have always had to figure out how to worship God in changing times. So this is nothing new. Maybe new for us, but it's nothing new for God's people. In 2 Samuel 7, God promises David that he is going to establish a forever kingdom, and David's son is going to reign over this eternal kingdom. So when the Babylonians led the Jews out of Jerusalem and out of Judah, those who actually remembered God's promises probably wondered about that forever kingdom that God promised and what is going to happen to it. So it was there in exile that the Jews had to figure out how to worship God after the Babylonians destroyed the temple and they were no longer living in the promised land. So Think about this for a second. God's promise to his people was tied to the land. And it was the temple where the sacrifices of atonement were made. Without blood, there is no forgiveness, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9.22. In Leviticus 17.11, uh, we read, it is the blood that makes atonement. So, in exile, the Jews had to figure out, how do we worship God in these troubling times? And where do we find atonement? And like I said, it was during this, this time of the exile that historians believe the synagogue started to appear. And the synagogue was their answer to how they were going to worship God outside of the promised land with no access to the temple that had been destroyed. So, for Parkview, we had to face a similar question. How are we going to worship when access to our church building was cut off to us? And our answer was to embrace social media and technology as a way to continue to keep us connected when government officials were encouraging us to stay apart all because of uh, public safety. So no matter where you stand on this issue, it was a prudent and pragmatic decision. Um, you know, looking back at life in quarantine, you know, it really reminded me how God's people always need to be ready to react to the changing times. I'm getting a little bit older, getting a little more fixed in my ways. Uh, but I need, to be, I need to understand that I need to be ready to adapt and to change because there's one thing constant in this life, and that's change. 
In the Gospel of Mark, there's this account of a man who's driving out demons. And the disciples told him to stop because he was not connected to Jesus and he was, and he was not connected to the disciples. But Jesus tells his disciples, leave him alone. And then he adds, whoever is not against us is for us. Whoever is not against us is for us. And I always found that odd. People who might not actively embrace Jesus can still be for Jesus. So, you know, there are, are a lot of negative things about social media. I ignore the bad. I mean, I let it just go off me like water on a duck's back. And so, so it's kind of ironic how, you know, church leaders have had, had to embrace social media as an avenue to keep their congregations connected and worshiping as one. And if you saw that meme, it was something like, and just like that, all preachers were televangelists. Um, look, I know there's a lot of bad on social media, but we can ignore it. And look what it did for us. It helped keep us together as a body. You know, when, uh, if you're watching on Facebook, you know, it's easy to make those comments while the sermon is going. A little bit tougher on YouTube. But in those comments, we were able to kind of connect with one another as we say, hey, you know, good point, I like this, and then somebody else would react. So we were able to stay connected uh, somewhat, you know. It's not how we would normally do things, but we had to adapt and change. Could we have responded better during this pandemic? Maybe. But Parkview's leaders um, did the best they could with what they had. And, you know, I'm going to post a video at some point showing what goes on behind the scenes here. And when we're sitting home worshiping, it all looks seamless. But there's a lot of things that's going on behind the scenes to make this worship time possible. And I really appreciate everyone's sacrifices. Um, Wait till you see how uh, Mark A, I don't, I'll mispronounce his last name, make sure that the words are matched up with the singers. It's amazing. But they did the best they could, and it got us through. June 7th is coming, and we're going to be back together as a body as best we can. You know, Mel's video is showing us how we're going to kind of respond. And even coming back, it's something new that we have to adapt to. We have to sign up. We have to uh, keep our distance. Uh, if you look, you know, communion is going to be through the cups, you know, so nobody else is going to touch the wafers. They're not going to touch the cups. It's just going to be us. When you come in, you're going to see pews roped off that this is closed, all to promote social distancing. We're not done adapting and changing yet. So as I look back at Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, and the Jews to see how they responded when their normal lives were upended, I walk away with an appreciation of how it's okay to change as long as our hearts and minds are focused on the right thing. Adam and Eve learned to call on the name of the Lord. Noah built an altar to sacrifice to God. Abraham learned that God was the God of everywhere. The, the Jews figured out a way to worship God until that relationship, that temple, and that wall around Jerusalem were rebuilt. And we have learned that sometimes we have to be pragmatic when life is disrupted. The writer of Hebrews tells us in 1025 how we should not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And while we were not able to meet together physically, Brian, Jeremiah, Mel, Carrie, Jamie, Larry, Mark, and Mark, and so many more helped us meet together in a different manner through videos, through social media posts, through email messages, and through letters. 
they did this because they understood how important it is for us to wor worship God as a unified body of believers. And we need to maintain that connection with one another. The church is God's people. We are a community. We were meant to be together and worship together, not to be separated and worship in our homes separately. But that's what we had to do for a season, and now we're slowly going to be coming back. And, you know, we understand if you have concerns, you're still going to be able to watch the sermons virtually. You won't have to come into uh, the church building because we want to make sure you feel safe and we want to honor God. And so we're not, you know, Jeremiah is not going to be the truant officer of Parkview Christian Church and go out and hunt you down, so don't worry about that. Um, so they understood this important of still being connected while we were apart. And you look, I understand God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And there are th some things that relate to our faith that are just non-negotiable. No, we're not changing, we're not budging, we're not moving. But I pray we don't get caught up being inflexible on matters that are not really essential to our faith. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6 is called the Shema. It's the Hebrew word, word for hear, because that's the first word of this passage. I want to read uh, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. At the core of what we do, we need to make sure we love the Lord our God. The two most important commandments are to love God and love our neighbor. No matter what life throws at us, no matter if we lose access to our church building, wherever we find ourselves, I pray people will find us loving God and loving our neighbors and being that faithful, united community. As God's people, we can worship God anywhere because, as Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. In Matthew 9, as we read about the calling of Matthew, who is a tax collector, the Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples, why he ate and drank with sinners and tax collectors. Part of Jesus' reply was that they need to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, which is from Hosea. While we are practicing social distancing, and while we were under lockdown in our homes, we could not do church the way we always did church. However, we sought to honor, serve, worship, and love God the best that we could. Maybe we didn't follow everything the way we normally did. Oyster crackers have a leavening agent in it. I believe it's bacon soda. But I believe we figured out what it means when God said that he desires mercy and not sacrifice. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for loving us. I don't know why we've had to go through this time that we did, but I pray that on the other side that we come out stronger and better for it. I pray that even as we were apart, that our hearts were still connected with one another. Help us to be careful as we come back together as a body of believers and maintain social distancing and all, all those other helpful precautions to keep everyone safe. And thank you for loving us and thank you for getting us through this storm. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Bobby, for today's message. And we are looking forward to next Sunday uh, when we're together again. And uh, as Bobby said, uh, this is a no judgment zone. So uh, if you do not feel safe coming back, we want to encourage you to continue to connect with us online. 
Um, and we, we love and miss all of you, but um, we look forward to when we're all back together. Um, but I appreciate today's message because we, we do. We worship a holy God who loves us wherever we are, and we're connecting with him all the time. And so um, I hope and pray, first of all, that you have a great day. And the next week, um, again, continue to uh, connect online this week and, and register for the service. Also want to remind uh, Larry's class is coming on just in a few minutes and continue to connect there. Thank you, Larry, so much for continuing that. And that will continue as well, even after we're back together. So thanks a lot. Have a great day.